Let's start with a word of prayer, shall we? Gracious Father, it is by your spirit that we are here this morning. You have called us. You've compelled us. And we pray, Father, for your spirit to be mightily upon all of us, that you would fill us to overflowing, and that you may be lifted up and exalted in all things. We thank you, Father, and praise you in the glorious name of your, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Last week, our sermon was entitled, Heirs of the Heavenly Promise. And we are heirs of that heavenly promise. And today's scripture, which was just read, is, was part of that last week. But this morning, I want to go into more detail into verses 13, 14, well, through 16. Uh, there's an important message there for us. And so I want to spend some time in that. Let me reread this to you. Verse 13, talk about all those who it talked about before, Cain, Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham. It says, all these died in faith, not having received the promise, but having seen it afar off. They were assured of those promises, embraced them, and confessed that they were but strangers and pilgrims on this earth. Verse 14, for those who say such things declare plainly, those who speak of being strangers pilgrims on this earth declare plainly that they seek a homeland as all of us do. Our kingdom or our home is not this world. We are seeking a homeland. And truly, if these had been called to mind, the country from which they came, they came out of, they had an opportunity to return. But now, they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. In Genesis chapter now in Genesis, we read about Abraham speaking to the people of the land in which he was a sojourner. We turn to Genesis 23. Turn there with me, if you would. Genesis 23, verses 3 and 4. And we have Abraham speaking here. He says, Then Abraham stood up from before his dead, that would be Sarah, his wife had just died, 170 years old, she had died and spoke to the sons of Heth, people living in the area at that time, in Canaan, saying, I am a foreigner and a visitor among you. And he was. Give me property for a burial place among you that I may bury my dead out of my sight. This is the first indication we have in the scripture of, of uh, burial. Many of the pagans uh, of that time used, uh, they cremated their, their, their dead. No right or wrong, they just did. Tradition, culture. But here, Abraham frankly admits his status as a sojourner to the sons of Seth. And we'll read in a few minutes here, also to Ephron the Hittite, living among the people, so the Hittites, living among the people of Canaan in this time, about 16, 16th century B.C. Notice in this verse, Abraham made no claim to any of the land rights by right. Land which God had promised him in Genesis 12, all the land of Canaan. But he did not claim it as a right. He asked for it. Abraham did not present his neighbors with a, any demands, and he might have, but instead requested permission to secure title to a piece of land, not by right, but as a favor and as a price. He's a sojourner in the land, new to the area, new to the people. 
and he asked for land as a favor. He and Ephron the Hittite agreed to 400 shekels of silver in, it says, in the hearing of the people. Not done in secret in a dark room somewhere. All heard, all knew. Here in Genesis, the sons of Heth refers to Abraham as a mighty prince. Ephron the Hittite refers to him as my Lord at the city gate. And if you go to the scripture, three times Ephron repeats, I will give you the field and the cave. Three times he mentions that. All these people were well aware of Abraham's exploits as described in Genesis 14. In defeating the four kings from the eastern Mesopotamia, they came down, defeated many of the city-states, and then took on the five kings of Sodom and Gomorrah. And scripture tells us Sodom and Gomorrah, the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah, fled from before these kings. A matter of defeat for this entire area. They had been in servitude to these kings, these four kings, for some years, 12 or 13 years, and they were attempting to break the yoke from these kings. And coming down from Mesopotamia, they took the vassal states out and eventually these four kings. So these people knew of Abraham, knew of his exploits, and knew what he had done. A man with 300 of his own trusted people born in his camp. He defeated these four kings. What a great victory for God. God was in it with him. And the people of the land were very respectful to Abraham. And for good reason. They wished to give him, Abraham, what he asked. Abraham would not accept their free gift. His dealings with the people of the land is quite noteworthy if you look at it. He is kind. He is courteous, not demanding. He is thoughtful. And he did not hesitate to make it known to them that he was a sojourner in the land. A stranger, an alien to them as we are or ought to be in this world in which we now live. As was Abraham, we all are just passing through the world, this world is not our home. It's temporal, it's not eternal, and it's not of God. This world is sin, and God's calling us to holiness. We'll come in the clouds of heaven to take us to be with him forever and ever. The patriarch, considered to be the father of the faithful, made it crystal clear that he was a sojourner in the world by choice and not a resident of this world. In Chronicles, Chronicles 1, David gives an accounting of all he as king had prepared for the building of the temple in Jerusalem, as well as his own personal gifts of gold and silver, which amassed to quite a fortune. David then blesses the Lord, Yehovah, before the assembly. And we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 29, verses 13 through 15. Now therefore, and this is David speaking here, now therefore our God, we thank you and praise you. We praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people? that we should be able to offer so willingly as this, what they're giving, what they're offering to God. For all things are from you, and of you, your own, we have given back to you. So God was simply giving to them, and from what God provided for them, 
They were giving back to him their tithes, their offerings, and gifts, many, many gifts, to build the temple. Then verse 15, 15 says this, For we are aliens and pilgrims before you, O Lord. All our fathers, as all our fathers were, our days on earth are a shadow and without hope. Have you noticed that? This world brings many shadows, many dark things to our lives because it's filled with sin. But it brings no hope. It's a world without hope, without a way out, without a way to break through and to live that came through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Only through him, only through God, is there salvation. Only through God is there hope. Only in God can we trust and depend on to see us through. And in interest in, in uh, Psalm 39, we see very similar words, verbiage repeated in this psalm. The psalmist writes, in 39.12, Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear to my cry. Do not be silent at my tears, for I am a stranger with you, a sojourner as to all my fathers. This was a thought that was fixed in the mind of David and many of his day. They knew they were passing through temporal, a world of sin, they were not meant for this, not created for this, and God didn't intend for them to live in this world any longer than he ha they had to, than we have to. He provided a better place for us. He promised us a heavenly kingdom. The mindset of the people in the days of David who ruled over Israel seemed to be unchanged from that of the days of Abraham. We are sojourners. We are aliens. We are foreigners. We're not of this world. They made that quite clear. And I pray that in our hearts and our minds, we will come to understand that truth as well. Because we are not of this world. We live in God's kingdom in this world. A kingdom of power. A kingdom of love. And His power should be obvious in our lives as we live day to day in this world of sin. It's God's grace. It's God's mercy. It's his love and his power that gets us through. Not by strength, not by might, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. We are not of this world. The mindset has not changed. Under the rule of David, the king and his son Solomon, Israel had become a mighty and very prosperous nation. Their territorial boundaries had increased dramatically. And many nations now paid them tribute. They had become affluent. And scripture here refers to all this abundance. David amassed a fortune for the kingdom. David added to that fortune his own personal giving, which amounted to a, to a small fortune, a lot of money refers to all this abundance that God had supplied to his people for the building of his house. God gives to us so we can return give to him for his work and help those around us. Not to save up, not to hoard for a rainy day, but to use for the kingdom of God. It indeed was a golden age for God's people, the reign of David, And yet, with all they have been given, the psalmist writes, we were aliens, we are aliens and pilgrims before you. It's interesting that the faithful of that day understood that this world was temporal. This was not their homeland. Abraham was called out of his home and look forward to that heavenly promise that was given to Abraham by the one who called him out of Ur the Chaldees, his homeland, 
to follow where he, Yahovah, would lead him into life and to build the kingdom of God on this earth, a kingdom of faithful followers who would hear his voice and who would follow him. It's clear that the Old Testament patriarchs and believers did not look at this home, this world, as permanent. They saw it very temporal, very temporary. They were just passing through aliens, pilgrims, in a land where they sojourned. In Hebrews eleven sixteen, 16, there's some interesting wording in that verse that one finds in the Greek, but doesn't show itself clearly in the translations that we use today. I'm going to read to you verses 13, 14, and 16 from the Newberry Interlinear Bible. I just want you to listen to this. A little bit choppy, but you read it and you get the context. Verse 13. In faith died all these, all those who go gone before, all those mentioned in, in uh, Hebrews uh, chapter 11, all these died not having received the promises. But from afar, them having seen. They saw them from afar. They saw what God was doing, and they believed by faith. They were saved by faith as we are. They believed by faith that God would keep his promises. Amen. Having seen from afar, having been persuaded, and having embraced, and having confessed that strangers and sojourners they were on the earth. Verse 14, for they who such things say, I am a sojourner, I am a pilgrim, a stranger, plainly declare that their own country they are seeking. And verse 16, when we look at, but now a better they stretch forward that is a heavenly. Interesting wording, but now a better they stretch forward to. Do you get the gist of that? A better, what's better, the heavenly country? They stretch forward to. Wherefore, is, is not ashamed of them God? Not ashamed to be called their God, for he prepared for them a city, the heavenly Jerusalem, the new Zion, in which his people will dwell. The writer here speaks in verse 16 of a stretching forward to something, not just reaching, but stretching an effort, extenuating effort. Going the extra mile. And that something better was that heavenly kingdom. And this perfectly fits with scripture we find in Paul's epistles, throughout his epistles. Look at three examples of stretching forward to something better. Reaching beyond one's own capacity. Striving earnestly for this, that which is worthy of our high calling from God. We live in a world of sin. And we all know from experience that it ain't easy. Pardon my English, but it ain't easy. You know, many Christians believe we're going to hell. I will submit to you we are in hell, waiting for deliverance and the eternal kingdom. And our walk in this world is a difficult walk. But by faith, believing, trusting in God, we can make the walk because it's him who does the walking for us and not we ourselves. The Bible makes it very clear that of ourselves, we can do nothing. And the Bible says if you, are, you have the Spirit, if you're led by the Spirit, if you walk in the Spirit... You are a new creation because it's no longer you doing the walking, 
no longer you doing the leading, it's God leading you in this world. We are led by sin in this world. We are born in sin, we're controlled by sin, we are in bondage to sin. And at the cross, Jesus broke the bonds of sin in our lives. He cut away the body of flesh from our heart, symbolized by circumcision. Removed it from us, so it no longer have mastery over us. In Christ, through Christ, through the Tony sacrifice, we are free from the bonds of this sinful world and all the tentacles that sink deep into our bodies. Christ can free us from these things. He's the only thing, only one who can free us from these things. The first scripture I look at is 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run? For those of you who run in a race, you know that. But only one receives the prize. A thousand may run, ten thousand may run, but one receives the prize. The good news is that in God's kingdom, all who run earnestly seeking God, will gain the victory and be assured of and given the prize. And he says, run in such a way that you may win. Stretch. Reach out beyond yourself. Go the extra mile. Break through that running wall when you're tired and beat and constrained by the things of this world. Run through it. And how does one run a race in order to win? I'm not a runner. But one prepares for the event. You train. Endless hours of training again and again and again. It doesn't happen by chance. You prepare yourself for every contingency. And in this world, anything can happen. Anything can go. And we prepare for those things. How do we prepare? Drawing close to Christ. Coming to know His will. Walking in that will and standing on His word. And not being, not allowing ourselves to be deviated from the word and what God called us to do by the world and all the things in the world that would call us away and to set down our goal in Christ, and to follow it. And the world called us to do that. You prepare for every contingency. You do the things that others are reluctant to do. You pull out all the stops. And if you think about it, those who are in the world and who are very successful, whether they're, whether they're powerful, whether they have made a fortune, no matter what their success is, they pull out all the stops. They let nothing get in their way. They train, prepared, studied, learned to get where they are. Few get there by accident. Most of them made it happen. I used to listen to to, uh, motivational speakers years ago. If there ain't a way, make it. If there is a be, it's up to me. Humanism. I lived in that for a lot of years. But what I can't do, I know Christ can. And he calls me to turn away from these things, to surrender submit to him, and allow him to work in me those things that I cannot do. And there's much, there's much I and we cannot do of ourselves. I.e., in other words, he's saying, Spend countless hours coming to know the will of God. I wonder how many this morning do that. Spend countless hours coming to know the will of God. In his revealed word to us, the Bible, the Holy Scriptures. As it was with Christ, the word of God is our sure defense. Our only defense against the enemy 
We fight not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, spiritual weakness in heavenly places. We fight against odds that are overwhelming that we cannot contend with. But in Christ, we are more than conquerors. We are victorious in him because he said, I have overcome the world. And by faith, we believe that, and by faith, we can be overcomers as well. Praise God for the provision that he makes. Scripture admonishes us, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Is the mind of Christ in you? I pray that it is. Seared into the mind of Christ was the express will of God. I'll repeat that. Seared, burned into the mind of Christ was the express will of God. When he was tempted, he didn't give him worldly wisdom to the devil. He gave him the word of God. And he knew the word of God well enough to be able to speak to what the devil was tempting him with. He overcame the enemy greater than mankind, not by power, not by might, but through the Spirit, giving him the word of God to speak when the time was needed. And that word had this transformational effect on the hearts and minds of all, including Christ, resulting in relentless, unfailing love to us and, more importantly, to God. That's the key. Coming to know him, having his word, his will seared in our minds. And yet our minds are full of so many things. I know a pastor who was, doesn't watch TV, I may have mentioned this once before to you, doesn't watch TV, he found himself on a Saturday night uh, watching a program on Channel 8. I don't know the channel. Uh, anyway, Channel 8, and uh, it was an English whodunit movie. He said it was a great movie, but he said for three days, for three days he could not focus on the Word of God. Saw nothing improper. They didn't curse, scream, none of those things. But for three days, three whole days before he could come to the place where he clear his mind of that and focus on the word of God. It's amazing what the world brings to us and the impact it has on our lives and we are oblivious to all of it, to much of it, I should say. Romans 12, 2 tells us we are not to be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Why? That we, we may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. As we behold, we become changed into his likeness. As you behold the world, you focus on the world, you become changed into its likeness. And the question is, who do you want to be like? The world? Look at it. Christ? Set your mind, your heart, your focus on him. And it will happen, not magically, but by the power of God who work in you and through you to do his glorious and perfect will and bring these things to be, become a reality in the lives of all those who follow him. Second verse is 2 Timothy 4, verse 7. Paul said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. I have fought the good fight. Do you ever notice that Victory doesn't come easy. When you're in a battle, it's life and death, and we are in a battle. It is life and death. Your eternal salvation hinges on how we, 
how you do down here, whom you choose to trust to walk with, and choosing not to trust in your own works, your own merits, your own might, your own strength. I've fought the good fight. We're all going to finish the race, every one of us. There's no doubt about that. We'll be in the grave or rise when he comes. We'll all finish the race. He said, I have kept the faith. Have you kept the faith this morning? Are you walking with him? Is the joy of the Lord in your heart? I was putting the sermon together yesterday, and the uh, song kept going through my heart. I found myself, when I got to the, from, the, from my desk to, to go do something, I, was, I found myself dancing. I don't dance. The world is not my home. I don't live any longer. And those song, words kept going through my mind. And I found myself joyous. Praise be to God. Because we have a great reward to look forward to. God provided everything for us, pulled out all the stops for us. He gave his son Jesus. How much less can we do? Fighting a good fight. Finishing the race. Keeping the faith. This speaks of effort, stamina, determination. And these things are essential, critical in our struggle to resist evil and to flee from wickedness. They're essential. Scripture warns us in Genesis that sin lies at the door. Speaking to Cain, before he killed his brother, he said, sin lies at the door. Its desire, sin's desire is for you, for us. But we should rule over God's words we should rule over it. Sin does not need to have dominion in our lives. It's a choice we make. We should rule over it and let it rule over us. And that victory comes in knowing him, trust him, walking with him by faith, allowing him to work his work in us, following in obedience his good and glorious will in all things. We should rule over it. And I wonder how many here this morning, and I speak to myself, are under bondage to something. We all are. But we need not be. John 2 verse 1 says that you need not sin. No one needs sin. But if you do sin, Praise God, we have an advocate with the righteous, the advocate, Jesus Christ the righteous, one in our corner who took the hits for us, died for us on the cross, and paid the price that sin demanded. We are not to give a place or an opportunity to the devil. Instead, we are to be sober and vigilant. Why? Because our adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And I tell you what, when you look around this world, when you talk to people, mingle with people like we did last Sunday, it's amazing the people who he is consuming. And he consume us, he will consume us if we're not rooted in the word of God, rooted in Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. He's our only hope. Amen. Daily we are to put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might, not your own. James tells us in 4 7, therefore submit to God. When you're tempted, things aren't going right, submit to God. In his power, in his strength, resist the devil and he will flee. Trust in the power of God alone and not our own strength. 
Our last scripture is Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 through 15. Paul said, Brethren, I do not count myself as having apprehended or reached it. But what I, one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, what's behind us? The world and sin. Jesus said, a man who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not worthy. We're not to look back at the world. Why? Because it's not all ugly. There's a lot of things out there that can be very desirous. He says, don't look back. Trust in me. Keep your focus on me, on the heavenly promise, a better country, the heavenly country. Don't let the world draw you away from life because that's what it does. Life is in Jesus. Life is in God the Father. Life is in God the Holy Spirit not the things of this world. Forgetting those things which are behind the world and reaching forward, stretching forward to those things which are ahead. And what's ahead of us? The heavenly country. That's a promise we've been given. First Adam and Eve, then to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and on down, Moses, the heavenly country. It's interesting, the Bible doesn't talk about heaven as a place. It says the heavenlies. It never says heavenly place. If you look at your Bible, the Bible, they add the word place. It's not a place where you will finally get to the heavenlies. We will be with God in his holy city, which has foundations. But heaven is wherever God is. He's out in the middle of nowhere. That's where I want to be. I want to be with him. Press forward toward the goals for the pride of the upward call of God. Anyone here heard the upward call from God? I pray everyone has. Press forward. Stretch, stretch, reach out for the goal, for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, that is our salvation. Amen. We threw it away in the Garden of Eden. We lost it. But God, in his infinite love and mercy, came while we were yet sinners, sent his Son to die for us, that the penalty of sin total separation from God would be nullified. And in Christ, it is nullified. Our salvation is made sure in whom, him who gave his life for us. There is much of this world we as followers of Jesus need to unlearn. We grow up. We're schooled in the world that is filled and live alongside sin. It's part of their life. It's part of our lives. It still is today. We need to learn much of this to make way for the things of God. If we're filled with ungodly things, worldly things, God's limited to what he can put into us. God would that we, that everyone, so lived their lives, trusting in him totally, that all, all would see the power of the resurrected Christ in us, lived out in us day after day after day, circumstance after circumstance, seeing God's mighty hand work to deliver us from the things the world will bring to us. And the world has brought much to us in the way of sin. When Adam and Eve sinned, they opened Pandora's box of horrors. And it is a box of horrors. Look around you. I spent most of Wednesday, uh, New Year's Day, I'm sorry, in the hospital. Gentlemen, three weeks ago, fine. Today, 
four, stage, stage four cancer in his lungs. They said it metastasized his brain's bleeding on life support. Got some better news yesterday, but no guarantee will come out. That's sin. The result of sin in a world of which we are part of. And it affects every one of us. Whether we choose to live in it or not, it took Abraham out. It took Noah out. It took Methuselah out. It took Adam and Eve out. It took all of them out. And they all, all were giants in the faith. God would see the power of the resurrected Christ lived in our lives each and every day in the lives of his people who are called by his name. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. And we're living God's power in our lives and seeing him work. We've got work to do. The life of a Christian is to be lived in demonstration of the spirit and the power of God. Revealing that while we may live in this temporal world, we are of the kingdom of God. Behind enemy lines, we may be the underdog, but we will be the victors. Let there be no doubt. I read the back of the book and so did you. You know. We are of the kingdom of God. The heavenly. The eternal. And not the earthly. We, as Abraham and all the other great men of faith, live by faith. We live by faith. A demonstration of his power working in our lives, each and every one of us. And my prayer is that everyone here will come to the place, draw so near to God, so trust in God, that the thought of even doing anything on their own escapes them, it's gone. Jesus emptied heaven, or God emptied heaven, emptied heaven of Jesus, gave them to us to pay the price of sin, the sin that we are guilty of, not him, the sin we are guilty of, that we might be reunited with him, make it possible for all men to have salvation, and simply ask us to choose, to choose wisely, to choose life, to choose him, because he is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. There is no other name under heaven or earth by which man might be saved, save Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Bow your heads with me. Gracious Father, we live in a world that is filled with sin, and we see the dreadful consequences of a decision made so long ago on all those around us, Father, even us, we see the results of that decision. We see our perishability. But Father, there's hope in you because you're the God of the living, not the God of the dead. And all those who by faith choose to believe in you, choose to trust in your Son, choose, Lord, to surrender and submit to you. All those who thus choose are sons of the kingdom, heirs to the heavenly promise. We are declaring that we are pilgrims and strangers and aliens in this land. This is not our home. Our home is with you. We, Lord, are just passing through to your kingdom to live and reign with you eternity. And I pray that each one here this morning will come to see believe and walk in the way that will bring them life. And that way is your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you and praise you and ask your rich blessings upon us this new year. 
In Jesus' name, amen.